Hello, everyone. You are welcome to the concluding part of lesson two. We will be talking about chemical bonding. During our class, we spoke about different types of chemical bonding. And the first one is ionic bonding. I mentioned that ionic bonding involves the complete transfer of electrons from one atom to another. And I gave an example of sodium and chlorine, where sodium has an electron at the outermost shell, having a very low ionization energy, while chlorine is on the it has a is a deficient of one electron on the outermost shell, and has a high ionization energy or high electron affinity. It has high electron affinity, willing to accept an electron from sodium. And uh, I also mentioned the electronegativities. The electronegativity of sodium and chlorine are wide apart. And that is a very good condition that favors ionic bonding. So electronegativity on the periodic table, uh, atoms have uh, elements have uh, their individual electronegativities, and uh, equation five here is a good relationship between electronegativity, the molecule, because we have two different types of electronegativities. I think we, we should have uh, is it Pauline also, but the molecule electronegativity is like an average of the ionization energy and uh, electron affinities so when we uh, uh for instance sodium has a small electronegativity value while chlorine has a large electronegative value if you go online you can search for periodic tables that will display the electronegativity values of uh, elements and with that you notice that at the left hand side of your periodic table the electronegativity values are smaller than on the right hand side and also at the top side of the uh, periodic table the top parts of the periodic table also has uh, higher electronegativity values so from the bottom left corner of your periodic table electronegativity increases to the top right corner of the periodic table So the whole idea of ionic bonding is to say that electrons, there is complete transfer of electrons from one atom to the other. Okay, let's talk about uh, covalent bonding. Covalent bonding involves sharing of electrons between atoms and it's usually occurs with elements whose electronegativity values are not so wide apart. It exists between two elements where the ionization energy is too large for an electron to be completely lost to the other party. Or the other party also has a low electron uh, electron affinity to completely accept another electron from the uh, first element. So, uh, let's. So, in the case of uh, sodium. Well, we said we had uh, two electrons over there at the innermost shell, eight electrons at the intermediary shell, and one electron at the outermost shell. This has a low ionization energy. 
if the ionization energy is low, it will be easy for the sodium atom to lose the electron. And when it loses the electron, it will be left with uh, completely filled orbitals. While the chlorine electrons are the enamel shell, its electrons are the intermediary shell, making thin, and the seven electrons. At the outermost shell, as I electron affinity, it also has I ionization potential. The energy you would uh, require to remove an electron from this chlorine atom is very large compared to the energy you require to add one electron to it. So to add one electron is uh, easier than to say you want to take another electron from it. So. But we also have some cases where this is not uh, very easy. Let's take, for instance, the hydrogen atom, which has one electron on the outermost shell, and the other one, another hydrogen atom has one electron on the hydrogen atom. Which of them is going to lose the electron? That is, uh, it's not a feasible, it's not easy to decide which of them. But uh, since both of them, require their innermost shell to be completely filled, then both of them can come together and share. Let me draw it uh, separately. Let's say this is um, the first hydrogen atom with its electron, the second hydrogen atom with its electron. Both of them can come, let's have a rough picture to show us to depict something like this. Both of them can come with their electrons such that the two electrons can be said to be revolving about the nucleus of the first atom. And the, both of them can also be said to be revolving about the orbit of the second atom. So that is the, uh, and uh, uh, that initiates the bond between the two atoms because they have something uh, that they are sharing. And because of their sharing electron, the energy uh, of the orbital is lowered compared to their initial energy levels before uh, coming together to share electrons. And during the class, I spoke briefly about the pictures with which we use to understand covalent bonding. One of which is particle in a box. The particle in a box picture is, uh, it can be depicted as what we have in figure three. We have, this is an hydrogen atom. This is another hydrogen atom. And this is an hydrogen molecule. And uh, the energy uh, of uh, the ground states, uh, the, the ground state energy of uh, each of the hydrogen atoms can be computed with this equation. And uh, this energy is related to the dimension of the uh, of the box the uh, dimension of the box, which is L, or the size of the atom. Since we are like talking in one dimension, just L. If L increases, then it means E will reduce. So that's what happens when the uh, two hydrogen atoms, when they come together, they form a bigger box. Their initial dimension L, L, they come together to form a bigger single box of dimension 2L. And the single, well, and the 2L will mean that instead of first having L in this expression, we'll be having 2L. And when we expand this uh, expression, we should have something of the nature, something like H 
cross square pi square over 8 m l square so and uh, this shows that after bonding the energy of the orbital is four times smaller than the initial energy of uh, bonding and this is uh, the uh, e bonding is the called the bonding orbital that is the orbital where the two electrons now or reside because of initially each of the hydrogen atoms were having a single electron this is uh, this arrow is uh, depicting the electron of this first hydrogen atom how this arrow is depicting the electron of the second hydrogen atom and after reacting after bonding the both of them will reside on a new orbital the energy would have changed so if we cannot call it the same orbital they were both initially so both of them will now co habit the new orbital which is called the e bonding orbital and when uh, there is need for excitation it will move the electrons that would expect to move to higher energy level and that next energy level is the e bonding oh, sorry e at the bonding orbital so let's move for it uh -huh. so in this figure it shows us three different scenarios three different scenarios well okay let me just try this here e equal to a square but i shouldn't write there equal to h square by square then square over two uh -huh. eraser Okay. Okay. Well, this figure A is telling us what I've just spoken about. We have the, uh, an hydrogen, uh, two hydrogen atoms. This is the first. This is the second. After bonding, the, uh, the, the this is the original energy level for the hydrogen atom you can see it aligns with this one they are forming is uh, the the line the uh, energy level of the first hydrogen atom is equal to the energy level of the second uh, 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 uh electron on the second atom or uh, the second hydrogen atom so after bonding both electrons of the both hydrogen atoms will occupy the bonding orbital, which has a lower energy compared to the original hydrogen atoms. And that's the bonding orbital. And the anti-bonding orbital is, will be the uh, energy level of the, will be the orbital for uh, the first excitation uh, energies of the atom. So the bonding orbital is like the ground state orbital, while the anti-bonding orbital is like the first excitation energy level of the atom. So these two are initial and these two are final. And if we add up the energies of this and this will have it to be greater than the final which is 
this and this. So let's move on to the second uh, example, which is helium. Helium has uh, two electrons. So this is the first helium atom having its two electrons in its uh, in the helium. Okay, that's too big. In the helium atom, we have two electrons, and the two electrons means that it is stable. That is the first orbital. It can accommodate a maximum of two electrons, and helium is already having two electrons. So now we have one helium atom having its two electrons, one spin up, the other spin down. Now that helium atom identical uh, to the first. So these are the initial states of the two helium atoms. And after bonding, they occupy the, uh, they occupy the uh, bonding and the antibonding orbitals. And uh, when you go through that, you see that there is no uh, uh, nature would not favor the bonding because the energy you would uh, have, the sum of these energies would be uh, would would not be lower than their initial states. So it is not going to be uh, there. There will be no need to bond for two. There will be no need for two helium atoms to bond because the energies of the bonding and the antibonding orbital would be large and uh, there is so there will be no points having these two come together when there will be no there will be no lowering of energy uh, levels because uh, the, okay the bonding orbital the energy of the bonding orbital is lower than that of the original ground states uh, levels for the two atoms but for the antibonding orbital it's high it's higher than their original states. For the fact that it is higher, we have to also put into consideration the uh, occupation of the antibonding orbitals, which would eventually make, uh, which is I, and will eventually make the uh, bonding of the two helium atoms a futile effort and an unnecessary uh, action. So let's talk about another Another example, which is uh, talks considers the lithium atom and the fluorine atom. The and you notice, unlike uh, the hydrogen and helium, where the energy levels of the individual atoms appear to be on the same level, but for Lithium, you can see it is higher than that of fluorine. The energy level of lithium is uh, of the uh, outermost uh, uh, electron or the outermost orbital for lithium is higher than that of fluorine. And uh, this is uh, this level also, also depicts the uh, electro negativities. This is having a very low electronegativity value. Uh, this is having a large electronegativity value. And um, when the bond, when lithium and hydrogen, when they form a bond, the new created uh, bonding orbital is having a lower energy compared to those of lithium and fluorine. So that means this will be uh, favored. And for the fact that even the uh, electronegativity value of lithium and fluorine, it's wider apart. It will even create an ionic bond compared to what we had in uh, figure A in the case of hydrogen. For in this case, we would have an ionic bond because lithium and fluorine, uh, we have a high tendency of forming an ionic bond 
because the energy levels of lithium and uh, that of fluorine are wide apart. And uh, when they, when they are uh, bond, they occupy the bonding orbital, which is all even lower than the lowest amongst lithium and uh, fluorine. So let's talk about the molecular orbital or tight binding theory. So this uh, picture tries to give a quantitative uh, version or quantitative picture of uh, the what we've spoken about in a particle in a box. And uh, to do that, we have to solve uh, the Schrodinger equation. And we cannot do that without talking about the Almetonian of the system. So the Almetonian that we have here is an addition of the kinetic energy and uh, two potential energies. So the kinetic energy term, K, is talking about the momentum, oh, sorry, the uh, momentum of the electrons squared divided by the mass of electrons. And uh, in the, we assume here that the nuclei are fixed while the electron is the only one that is in motion. We assume that the, uh, it's only the electron that moves, but the nuclei are fixed. So V1 and V2 are the columbic interaction between the electron at position R and the nuclei at positions R1 and R2, respectively. So we can say that we have a nuclei at position big R, a big R1, another nucleus, nucleus at a position big R2. Then we now have an electron, an electron at position small r. So this, imagine these are the positions as, as specified, then uh, and only the electron is in motion. So, so we assume that only the electron is in motion. The assumption is because we believe that the electron is lighter than the nucleus, at least uh, in this case, let's imagine that they are, we are dealing with just hydrogen atoms. When we are dealing with just hydrogen atoms, the nucleus of an hydrogen atom would have uh, a proton, while the, uh, the electron, and we know that the electron is about 1,800 times lighter than the proton. So for that reason, it's easy to assume that the, the nucleus is fixed while the, uh, while the uh, electron is, only the electron is in motion. Just like in our solar system, we assume that the sun is fixed, but it's only the earth that revolves around it. So, and K is kinetic energy. This formula is uh, familiar and uh, V, columbic interaction energies between the electron and the uh, nucleus. So V1 is the interaction between, columbic interaction between this electron and the first nuclear. V2 is the columbic interaction between the electron and the second nucleus. So all these are, are the vectors. And, and from what we did in, is it physics 102? We should be able to add vectors together to determine the uh, uh, magnitude of distance of separation. Mm -hmm. So Q here yeah, is the 
a charge, electronic charge, which is so charge of electron is same as the magnitude of charge of electron is same as charge of proton. We don't we need to remind ourselves about that. So we'll be adopting a variational solution to solve the Schrodinger equation and uh, and let's proceed. So we have a trial with a uh, function uh, given in equation 11. The trial wave function is telling us that the addition of uh, two orbitals, two atomic orbitals, as long as we have put also coefficients, this uh, phi one and phi two are coefficients, well, this uh, uh, ket one, this is called uh, ket, ket one and ket two, they represent atomic orbitals. So, and when you recall the, uh, one of the opening expressions for this lesson, we spoke about the Schrodinger equation to be the Hamiltonian, product of Hamiltonian and wave function to be equal to the product of energy and uh, wave function. So before we go there, when you look at uh, this expression, it is uh, like we having a wave function, which is equal to one wave function a product of one wave function with a, a coefficient with another wave function with its coefficient. So this combination, it's a linear combination because we are just having an addition. So, and that's, and the name is usually called this LCO, that is a linear combination of atomic orbitals. This is an atomic orbital and uh, both of them have been mathematically combined to form a simple addition. So, and uh, what we have will, will be will treat will, will this uh, phi one ket one is what we also have here. And the phi one ket one is can be said to be what is the Hamiltonian of, uh, what is Hamiltonian of the uh, uh, phi of, uh, the first orbital and the energy. So the Hamiltonian is uh, an addition of the kinetic and uh, potential energies, uh, energy times, and uh, that gives us the energy. So we can just have uh, this applies to K1 and this applies to K2. So let's keep that somewhere and as we move forward. So a Schrodinger equation can be written down for variational wave function will be given as equation 14. So this is still similar to what uh, we've uh, spoken about before. So H is Hamiltonian and uh, I, J are like the uh, number of uh, participating particles in the system. So when we add, when we will, with the knowledge of the Hamiltonians, of the Hamiltonian of the system, we can always get the energy of the system. So from this, this will form a matrix such that so we we'll say H11, it will be bra1 H gets one equal to bra1 k plus v1 k1 plus bra1 v2 k1. And uh, h12 will be just be similar to when you look at this configuration for h11, it is similar to what you have for h12. So, and this gives us the when you look at this, you know, it's different from the 
uh, so this epsilon naught is a function of the epsilon naught we had while talking about uh, the coercive energies in the previous place or the okay even the columbic interaction energy the epsilon naught here is uh, somehow different this is to this epsilon naught here tells us this epsilon naught here tells us that uh, uh, is uh, giving information about uh, the permittivity of free space but the epsilon naught in the other expressions which has which is a bit different they are same epsilon but they are their font types are different. This one is telling us about the uh, ground state energy of the system. Mm, let me see if I, there's something I should say before I leave. Okay. I think I just mentioned that uh, phi one and phi two are ground, they are, are complex coefficients and uh, they are also, I guess, sorry. Uh, phi one and phi two, they are complex coefficients. And uh, it, uh, Ket one is referring to the ground state orbital for an electron bound to nucleus one. So uh, this is referring to the ground state, the ground state energy of an electron bound to nucleus one. Well, the other term is referring to the uh, ground state energy of uh, an electron bound to nucleus two. So to continue, we'll be approximating using uh, what we call the bond of an approximation where only one electron, only one electron is uh, assumed to be in between the two hydrogen nucleus and it's all in the name of approximation. Okay, sorry, I forgot to mention that, uh, okay, in this expression, it ends with uh, the ground state energy plus uh, V cross, while the uh, H11, ground state energy plus V cross, while the H12, zero minus T, T is up in time. We'll uh, talk about them in details very soon. So V cross, V cross for bra one, cat one, or bra two, cat two is the columbic potential felt by orbital one due to the presence of nucleus two. So when you look at it here, this, uh, you said the uh, ket one is orbital one. So, uh, but uh, V2 is the, uh, which tells us the, the potential as a result of the presence of uh, nucleus two. V1 is the potential as a result of the presence of nucleus one. So, but, this uh, bra and ket, they are talking about orbitals, they depict orbitals. So bra one, ket one, talking about orbital one. Bra two, ket two, talking about orbital two. So this is telling us the columbic, this is columbic potential fields. So V cross is columbic potential field due to the orbitals as a result of the uh, columbic. Sorry, sorry. V cross is telling us the columbic potential fields 
by orbital one because of the presence of nucleus two or the columbic potential fields by orbital two due to the presence of nucleus one. Okay, well, so, and that is only, uh, that, that is only valid when we are talking about two different, uh, uh, two different atoms, that is one electron, an electron from one atom and the nucleus of the other atom. If we are to talk about it in terms of, uh, when we are to talk about two, uh, bra two V1 gets one, uh, talking about so, uh, bra two V1 gets one, we uh, should expect a zero because when we are talking about the, the effect of electron two and uh, electron one on nucleus one, it's uh, the effect of these two electrons to cancel out and uh, you can say the uh, total V cross would have experience as a result of this combination will give us zero. So, and uh, talking also about T, T is uh, referred to as open term. That is, the, uh, it talks about open of one electron from one uh, atom to the other. Uh, let me say from one orbital to the orbital of the other uh, atom. So the term T is equal to the minus one, I think. Ah, well, I think one, one of this should not be minus anyway. The term T in equations uh, 16 and 17 is known as the open term. And uh, also, bra one, Hamiltonian, gets two, will be zero due to orthogonality. And uh, what is that saying? There was one condition that uh, I skipped earlier, equation 13, in equation 13, it says that it's a condition of orthogonality. That is, if I and G, if they are the same, you should uh, you should get one. And if they are not the same, you should have uh, zero. So for the fact that, so the orthogonality term is applied in this expression, and uh, it would make sorry. And it will make this to be zero because this is two and this is one. We should have zero. So this two gives us, oh, sorry, this uh, term gives us zero. This term gives us the open term. This term gives us the ground state energy, while the other term gives us. Uh, V cross. And when you go through the text uh, carefully, you will be able to define easily what each of these uh, terms, what they mean. So like I've said about this one, is the ground state energy. For this, uh, sorry, as I've said for this, the ground state energy, and for this one, the uh, bra 2 V1 gets 2 is the V-cross, which tells us the columbic potential felt by uh, the electron in orbital two due to the presence of nucleus one. So like, um, in the original H, HIJ is uh, said to be, the HIJ is a two by two matrix, which would mean that uh, at this corner we would have uh, H11, H12, 
H21 and H22. So since our, for instance, what we have here, our H21 is zero minus T, or better still, minus T. And uh, uh, that is why we have uh, minus T at this corner. This is also H21 and uh, H22 is epsilon naught plus T V cross, which is exactly what we have here. And uh, this uh, phi one and phi two, they remain the they remain the complex coefficients for the linear combination of uh, the atomic orbitals. So if you attempt to multiply these two matrices, you should have what we have here. So at least this is as good as uh, everything we have here is as good as Hij. And what we have here is also phi i, and that will lead us to E phi i, which is what we have in equation, equation 14. The only difference now is that we are adding up all the ij's. So something is still missing here. We are adding up all of the, uh, we are adding up, uh, considering all the ij's and that will uh, give us the uh, energy of the system. So equation 19 can be interpreted as orbitals one and two have energies epsilon naught, which is shifted by V cross due to the presence of the other nucleus. So that is orbital one and two have energies, the ground state energies, and the ground state energy can be shifted due to the presence of another nucleus. I think uh, that makes sense when we say an atom is in the, an atom is in uh, the ground state, an uh, hydrogen atom is in the ground state. When you now bring another nucleus close to it, the energy will change. The configuration will change due to the presence of another electric field and another nucleus coming close to coming close to the electron or coming close to the atom it will change the uh, energies of the first of, of the original the original level of the orbital and it's also the equation is also telling us that electrons can up from one orbital electrons can up from one orbital to the other by t10 and also that in the Schrodinger, the time dependent Schrodinger equation, a wave function that started completely in orbital one would remain there if the matrix is diagonal. While a wave function that can oscillate between two orbitals if the off diagonal terms are present. So if the off diagonal times are absent, if we have this to be zero, that means an electron that is in orbital one will remain in orbital one. But if we have an open term, that means that an electron from orbital one can switch to orbital two. So diagonalizing the two by two matrix gives uh, equation 20. 
And from equation 20, we have equation 21 and 22, which is uh, the bonding and antibonding energy terms. So, uh, so far from in this section, we've been talking about uh, two hydrogen nucleus and uh, one electron. So what will happen if we are talking about maybe an hydrogen and uh, let's say a chlorine? We won't have exactly these expressions that we've had. And one of the things you'd have noticed is that while talking about, uh, while moving along, we were having some values, especially in this equation 15, 16, which came about uh, equation 19. The diagonal terms here appear to be the same. The non, even the non-diagonal terms also appear to be the same, but that will not be the case when we have uh, atoms or nucleus with two that are not identical, or two different types. We are not going to have the exactly the same values for the complex coefficients. The phi one and phi two will also not be uh, uh, equal like what we've seen so far. So as the energy difference between the orbitals and uh, of the non-identical nuclear widings, the tendency of complete transfer of electron increases, thereby forming an ionic bond. So also as, uh, because they are identical, because the, uh, because the two atoms we are considering, they are identical their energy levels, if not, uh, is, they are the same. So their electronegativity values are also the same. So that gives us covalent bonding. But if we are, there are two uh, different atoms with their electronegativity values wide apart, we would expect uh, more of ionic bonding. We would have higher tendency to form ionic bonding compared to uh, covalent bonding. So, so far we have uh, not considered uh, the fact that the two nuclei also attract. We have not considered the fact that the two nuclei also attract. We only spoke about uh, the, uh, while writing the Hamiltonian, we spoke about the kinetic energy of the electrons. We also spoke about the a potential of uh, V1 and V2, the, uh, the electric potential of uh, uh, nuclear one. As a result of the presence of electron of the of an electron, the single electron of the system, we did not talk about even that the two nucleus uh, nuclear may want to attract or repel. So uh, that was not put into consideration and the reason is just to make things very simple. So an approximation to make the columbic repulsion between the nuclear uh, cancel, the attractive energy between each nucleus and opposite electron is made and that gives equation 23. So when we, uh, an approximation, so after all the approximations, we are making another approximation to make the columbic repulsion between two nucleus cancel the attractive energy. And that gives us another uh, simpler expression 23. So from expression 23, you can uh, say that as the nucleus, uh, the nuclei as it gets closer, T, the open term increases, giving an unrealistic energy diagram shown in uh, Figure 25. So, as uh, and what is figure 25? Figure 25. This figure 25, which tells us that the, this is the. Uh, 
this is a graph of energy against uh, distance. So as uh, the distance between the two nuclei as they reduce, then the x-axis, the value on the x-axis will reduce, and as they increase, value increase. So for the fact that when the two atoms when they collide, it will it will still have a finite value. It doesn't make sense in uh, reality. The two atoms are not expected to uh, uh, touch each other for any reason. When you look at uh, when you look at this expression for potential, for instance, when R, small r, is equal to uh, uh, bigger, but now let's, uh, I would prefer we talk about it in terms of saying we having, let's use this one, we having a big R1. When big R1 is equal to big R2 in this expression, it can be said to be that the distance between them is zero. And when the distance here is, uh, when the uh, difference between this is zero, then V2 should be infinity. V2, the potential should be infinity and not having the finite time like what we have in that figure five. The fig figure five is telling us that even when the two nuclei, nuclei, when they collide, when they uh, that they can collide, that they can uh, they can come together, and the two nucleus can come together to form only God knows what, and uh, it will have a finite time. So we are the only problem we have here is that this graph is touching this axis. It is not as well to touch this axis. So. From the uh, from all the approximations made so far, this is, the, uh, is going to be the results because of uh, several approximations. So the only from uh, these graphs, when the distance of separation increases, when distance of separation increases. The things, uh, the graph we have in this area are still reasonable. They still agree with uh, reality. But as they get too close together, then they, uh, they no longer work. So there is uh, the next figure shows us a, a graph that tells us something that is more realistic. So this is a more realistic uh, energy level as a function of distance between it. And this energy level is telling us that the two nuclei will never touch each other. Because as they attempt to touch each other, they would require a very high energy and infinite energy to realize that uh, coming together. And uh, so for the bonding orbital, it is having a lower energy level compared to the anti-bonding orbital. And uh, for the bonding orbital, so it's, uh, when you look at this point, this point is having the lowest energy level. This point is having the lowest energy level. So the, not, sorry, not the point, is distance is having a lower energy level. And that means that this is the optimal distance of separation. This is the optimal distance of separation between the two atoms. So when the two atoms are separated by this distance, then we, uh, the, uh, it will be having the lowest energy. So, and when it's having the lowest energy, that is like uh, the stable uh, state for the uh, particular system. So by solving the Schrodinger equation, we can also always get the distance that is optimal 
for separating two nuclei. You can always get the uh, uh, distance that is optimal for two nuclei. So when uh, two when you, two nuclei when you are coming together, the uh, as I'm moving gradually from this corner, by they are bringing two nuclei together. There is becoming very stable, very stable, very stable, very stable. When I when the energy reduces, which is good, which is good, but it gets to a stage when you bring them closer, further the energy will now begin to increase again, which is not, uh, which is not uh, uh, favorable in nature. So it will rather stay at the base here. So this will be the, at this point, this is where the uh, atomic separation that would, uh, that would have the lowest energy and it uh, will be stable and uh, will be favored by nature. So let's move to Van der Waals bonding. It is also called the fluctuating dipole or molecular bonding. It is known to be long ranged and it involves no transfer of electrons and it's common with inert gases and, uh, and it's common with materials that cannot exhibit ionic or covalent bonding. It's common with materials with insulating uh, properties and low density temperatures. So Van der Waals forces is popular for being responsible for the ability of gecko lizards to uh, climb on the smooth surfaces. So, like the name depicts, fluctuating dipole. So it uh, assumes that one when one atom exhibits uh, uh, one 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 uh, atom acquires a momentary dipole moment, momentary dipole moment, it induces that dipole moment. On the second, on, on the second neighboring atom, which and uh, when the which also causes the second atom to polarize. So when the second atom polarizes, when the second atom polarizes, it can be said. Uh, okay, let me try and uh, draw something. Well, we talk about uh, dipole, even from the basics. We are talking about a system of uh, equal and opposite charges. So when one atom polarizes, we are talking about it flipping with the positive and the negative. So for the fact that one atom acquires a momentary uh, dipole moment, it induces it induces the same on another atom. This is now positive and this will be negative. So this will flip in the opposite direction. Then uh, now we can have a long range interaction between the two positive, a long range interaction between the two, sorry, a long range interaction between this positive and uh, the negative and the positive and another long range interaction. So there is interaction between, uh, attractive interaction between the two uh, dipoles. So when you read through, this text is talking about an hydrogen atom, which consists of a proton and uh, an electron. So, uh, and uh, this is talking about uh, the atom A, which has a proton and an electron. That is a dipole. It has a, an uh, equal and opposite charges, a proton and an electron. They have uh, equal but opposite charges. The same thing also another hydrogen atom, which also has a proton, 
and an election. When, uh, okay, and both of them are separated by a distance R. So when B, when A develops a dipole moment DP1, it induces polarization on uh, atom B. It induces DP2 on atom B. So, and uh, that is the origin of uh, their interaction. So, and the relationship between the electric field, so the electric field generated by uh, uh, atom A can be related to the dipole moments with uh, this expression we did in uh, under level. And uh, the induced uh, dipole, or the polarization developed by atom B can be related to the electric field by chi E. So the uh, so uh, this dipole moments created an electric field, which we can uh, relate with uh, another uh, parameter chi, which tells us the polarizability to give us our uh, dipole moments for atom B. So the question 25 tells us the electric field as a result of uh, the momentary dipole from atom A. Equation 26 tells us the uh, induced dipole on uh, atom B. And then the potential energy between the dipoles is given in equation 27. I believe we've done all this in 100 level. Even there too, we ended with saying that the force is attractive and proportional to uh, R to the power minus seven. Okay, so the uh, Van der Waals bonding, in conclusion, it's uh, as a result of one dipole inducing or uh, polarizing another atom to also form a dipole and the two dipoles interact and the two dipoles interact then we have uh, uh, bonding so i suggest you read through the text carefully if you have uh, any question what is there to ask so metallic bonding Right, so the, uh, this will be the fourth type we'll be talking about. Metallic bonding, uh, we cannot talk about metallic bonding without talking about the properties of metals, which includes they are very good conductors of electricity and heat. Why are they good uh, conductors of electricity? Because their electrons are free to move. The electrons move about freely. The electrons are delocalized so that because of the ability of the electrons to move freely, that is why they conduct electricity easily. And it is these free electrons that move about with the localization of these electrons that forms, that solidifies the bond between the uh, met, uh, metallic atoms. So uh, it is a uh, metallic bonding is similar to Covalent bonding, where electrons are shared, but in this case, but uh, the electrons move all through the crystal, unlike uh, unlike uh, covalent bonding, where uh, the the uh, they usually form insulating materials and uh, electrons are not free to move uh, easily. So the electrons in um, covalent bonding is uh, like limited to two. 
to the participating uh, atoms in the bond. While in metallic bond, the electrons move from one atom, it moves across the crystal, it moves all around. So you cannot say no uh, nucleus can uh, lay claim to any of the electrons. They, are, they, they just move freely. And uh, this makes also, it's not to make them have the properties they have, such as ductility, malleability, and uh, uh, low melting temperatures. So, for hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonding, mm, Okay, let's talk about um, something like uh, water, H2O. I'll talk about something like H2O. The oxygen, oxygen has, how many electrons has it? Oxygen, I think should have uh, eight electrons. It should have, uh, Two Adina and uh, six at the outer. <laughs> and uh, when it re reacts with um, mm, let me draw it differently. Okay, so let me now draw. And hydrogen would come this way and put its electron, yeah? Okay, so, and then hydrogen, sorry. I found so much strange this one. So this is the picture I can paint for for an uh, for a water molecule, just a dummy picture. At the center here is the nucleus. While the center here too is also a nucleus. Uh -huh. So the red represents the oxygen. Oxygen has eight electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Well, uh, but when it uh, forms a covalent bond with uh, hydrogen, hydrogen brings a single electron to form a covalent bond with one of the electrons of the oxygen atom. Another hydrogen atom brings a single electron to form another covalent bond with the oxygen, uh, same oxygen atom. So when you count the number of uh, electrons on the outermost shell of the oxygen atom, it uh, appears balanced. You can count eight electrons there as a result of the contribution of the two hydrogen atoms. And this set hydrogen atoms, this set hydrogen atoms also have two electrons on their outermost shell. Fine, it looks balanced. But we should also note that the single electron of hydrogen appears to be localized between these two atoms. And when that happens, it means that this particular nucleus appears to be naked because the electron, the single electron is no longer shielding it the way it used to before. And for that reason, the hydrogen atom, this particular hydrogen atom, or these two hydrogen atoms, they form covalent bond with this oxygen atom. And by doing that, their nucleus, their protons, can also interact with some other elements, some other elements, which may be another hydrogen, uh, another oxygen atom. So, and uh, that's, uh, and that will be like true Columbic interaction 
and it will now be that uh, uh, it is currently bonded with this, but for, for the fact that the nucleus is now naked, it will be interacting with some other nucleus forming, which forms hydrogen bond. You must have uh, seen something of uh, some pictures of this nature where they, when they want to draw uh, the water molecule, the big oxygen and uh, two small hydrogen. And uh, when we want to, let me, let me draw another type, another set for that. So this is uh, similar to what I've drawn. You see, this is a water molecule. One oxygen, two hydrogens. This is another water molecule. One oxygen, two nitrogens. These two nitrogens, <clears throat> they are covalently bonded to this oxygen. These two nitrogens are covalently bonded to this oxygen, but this particular hydrogen i don't i'm not sure if you can see that color this particular hydrogen is forming an hydrogen bond with the other oxygen out there so this green is the most hydrogen bond Well, this, no, sorry, go back, go back, go back, down. What's going on? Pen, oh, pen. Okay, well, this. Want color color black mm -hmm. well this can be said to be covalent bond so uh, this is also covalent bond so well an hydrogen atom is covalently bonded to its oxygen atom, it forms hydrogen bond with another oxygen atom because it appears naked because the, you know, the electron that shoots it is already in union with uh, another uh, atom. So it is uh, this particular type of bonding is uh, peculiar to hydrogen because hydrogen is the only atom where once that single electron is away, the it's uh, what you have left is a proton. It's just a single proton is uh, a good replica of an hydrogen nucleus. So an hydrogen nucleus is a single proton. An hydrogen atom is a proton covered uh, with one ob orbital carrying an electron. So once that electron is away, for any reason, maybe even uh, bonding with some other, uh, some other uh, atoms, the proton of the, of the uh, hydrogen atom will be available to bond with the, every, any other available uh, material, at least it is positively charged and it can attract some electrons, just like what we have here. It can attract some electrons. So, so it's uh, like an unending process in which we can also, if you can draw to you are tired, you can draw to say we have another water molecule here. 
Because fathers, you have an endowed water molecule there. That means we have uh, two hydrogens. So for that reason, we can bring out some hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds. So it's a uh, hydrogen bond is uh, known to hold ice together and uh, maintain the uh, DNA or protein structures. So let's move uh, straight to types of matter. So we're talking about uh, regular crystals. These uh, regular crystals, the bond, uh, it, it exists when atoms bond in uh, to form units of identical materials that are that repeats in uh, all directions. So the atoms are they form a regular pattern and uh, they are reproduced infinitely. An example of a regular crystal is uh, what we have in figure eight. When you look at that particular, when you look at it closely, you would notice a regular pattern. And uh, the regular pattern is even in three dimensional. So that is a uh, hydrogen, uh, sorry, that is uh, a regular crystal. So we also have molecular crystals. These molecular crystals, uh, this is uh, in figure A, a figure nine here, is talking about a molecule. This is a molecule of uh, carbon 60. 60 carbon atoms uh, form a ball which is called the uh, carbon system molecule. But even the carbon system molecule, being a molecule, can also form its own pattern, which is called, uh, so when you imagine this uh, puff puff forming regular, uh, uh, coming together to form this puff puff consisting of several atoms forming a molecule, the puff puffs now coming together in a regular pattern. And uh, you knowing that each of them is a molecule. So when the molecules, when they spread out in space, it can be said to be, uh, the, when they spread out in space, it can be said to be uh, molecular crystals. So types of atom. We have liquids. Liquids, they are, exist when atoms are weakly uh, attracted to each other or temporarily attracted. We are weakly and temporarily attracted to each other, such that molecules are free to move around and form new configurations. The liquid in the cup, it flows around within the cup. And as one molecule is bonding with uh, the other, it, uh, when one molecule is bonding with the other, it, uh, uh, well, it uh, disconnects with another. So let's talk about, uh, okay, so this uh, figure 10, this uh, shows diagrams of uh, crystals. When you look at uh, crystals, they have a regular pattern, and uh, when you, and they also have a regular. The atoms are equally distributed, and the atoms also have a particular orientation. When you look at the lines, they look parallel to each other the way they stand. And uh, for liquid, liquids, the arrangement is not having a particular order, and the orientations are not having any particular uh, order or any particular direction. But for liquid crystals, it's of course when we can, in this situation, we notice that the, uh, uh, the orientation are, 
aligned, but their positions are not regular. Their orientations are aligned, but their positions are not regular. So that is one of the unique things about this is having the, the positions, the orientations are aligned, but the positions are not regular. The positions are aligned, also the orientations are aligned, the positions are regular, the positions are not aligned, neither are the uh, neither are they regular. And also finally, for the, uh, okay, I, I can't I'm not really picture of this one, but we also have a, a station where the atoms will be evenly arranged, but their orientations will be uh, in uh, the direction of the orientations will be uh, randomized. So we also have amorphous solids. We have quasi crystals. Quasi crystals, they are ordered but have non periodic arrangements. So this is uh, figure 11 shows a quasi crystal. When you look at it from one angle, you will see and uh, you see some things that appear to be repeating. When you look at it very closely again, you see that. It's, they are not really repeating. So it's, it's a bit confusing. They are in between crystals and, uh, and amorphous materials. So, and uh, they don't usually exist in nature. So that is because they, we cannot really call them crystals. That is why we call them uh, semi-crystals or quasi-crystals. Mm -hmm. So what other type of materials do we have again? We have... Uh, Polymers. We have polymers, and uh, they are long chains of atoms. Examples are polyethylene, polypropylene, and even the DNA. So I think that section is just simple and straightforward. So in our next lesson, we'll be talking about the models of uh, solids in one dimension. Please let me know if you have uh, any question on from this video. And I hope that uh, next classes will become uh, more clearer and uh, would involve uh, things you can uh, relate to as time goes on. Okay, thank you, bye-bye.